Father, we just thank you for no feedback. <laughs> but Lord, we thank you for Bishop Bill. Father, we thank you for the message that you put on his heart. Lord, would you bless us with seed for our heart, Lord. Let the word go deeply. Let it produce the life of Christ. Father, let us have ears to hear eyes to see and a heart to believe and father that you would just bless the words coming out of bishop bill we thank you for the gift that he is to our body and to the body of christ at large and we thank you for the honor of sitting under this teaching today in jesus name Amen. well it's lovely to be with you uh, but john and donna hope you're having a delightful time up in the frozen northwest where you are freezing and we are basking here in warmer climes here in texas <laughs> Uh, I think, what was the temperature this morning? Was it 72 or 73 here in Dallas? Uh, uh, my last trip overseas, um, I was in uh, Egypt. I was there with my uh, spiritual son. We were leading a um, retreat there for Anglican clergy in the northern part of Africa. And afterwards, uh, we connected. We're driving back to Cairo. We're connected with um, a family that was friendly with him. They sent him a message and said, we are despondent and we really need to talk to you. And he said, well, uh, they were also in Egypt, but they didn't know he was there. He said, would you like to meet us uh, in Cairo? So they were two hours to the south. We were to the north. So we met in Cairo and had a lovely dinner. And we were walking back to the place where we were staying, which was at a, um, really an amazing um, compound where there's a cathedral. And um, when I'm overseas, I usually carry a very, very bright uh, tactical flashlight. Um, it's not only useful, but it's also um, can disorient somebody that's um, uh, causing trouble so you can get away or whatever, because it's extremely bright. So we got back over to the church. They had young twins they're teenage twins, and just very clearly heard the Lord speak and say, give the boy the flashlight. Well, there's a twin. He had a twin. It was a girl. Um, but I didn't have anything for her, but it was very clear. Give the boy the flashlight. So we got to where we were staying on the compound there. I turned the flashlight on and shined it. Uh, up the church, the, the cathedral church there is a um, design of a Bedouin tent with a spire and a cross uh, on the top. And the flashlight is very bright, like a spotlight. You can see it go all the way up and illuminate even the cross at the top. And his eyes got really big. And so I then I turned and I handed it to him, and his face just lit up. And of course, they're the whole family speaking Arabic um, very um, excitedly. And uh, my, my son said, uh, do you know what they're saying? And I said, well, you know, I have seven words of Arabic, and they haven't used any of the seven. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he said, well, what they're saying is Saturday, this coming Saturday, is the twins' birthday. And this boy, who's turning 15, had just asked his parents if for his birthday this year it would, would be possible to get a flashlight. Now, there are two things that are remarkable about that. One of them is the cultural um, differences that a 15-year-old uh, would be asking for a flashlight. Um, I've heard other 15-year-olds be thinking in terms of iPhones, Learjets, and cars. Um, <laughs> But the other one was just the absolute sweetness of the Lord knowing that and wanting to resonate with his heart. So God's desire is for our hearts to resonate with his heart. Um, and um, so we're talking about today, we're continuing to talk more about uh, the fingerprints of God. Remember we've said that there are ways that he manifests himself um, in the kingdom and in the earth uh, that are... Um, easy to recognize as his um, identity being expressed uh, in the world. Um, the 
fingerprints that God has uh, reveal kingdom order. Um, and the way that they they do it is uh, described as uh, systematic theology. Uh, at my office, I have a um, a, a roll to home office. I have a roll top desk, and there are all these little pigeonholes. And in that, uh, there are all kinds of things, and I have them stuffed in there in a way that, in my mind, they relate to each other. So systematic theology is like a um, a theological roll top desk to see how things uh, fit together. So today, what we're talking about is uh, forgiveness. But I'm going to start um, with the holiness of God. Um, the holiness of God permeates all three persons. Remember God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They have absolute and perfect knowledge of each other. They have perfect intimacy with each other. And they have perfect fellowship. God decided to extend his glory by creating. Now, God didn't have to create for his own understanding. He created because he wanted to share his glory with lesser creatures. But he also knew that if he was going to um, give freedom, that the result of the freedom was going to be sin being introduced into the world. And the biblical concept of sin has to do with how things uh, fall short of perfection. When I was a boy, some of you may recognize this, they're actually making a comeback. There's a, in the mall, near where we live, there's a, a place that sells uh, vinyl records. Have you heard of records, people here? <laughs> um, and the, the records had, um, the, the turntables had a, a, a speed control on it where they would be either 33 and a third revolutions per minute, 45, or 78. And what I would do as a boy is I would take the, the family turntable and I'd get a quarter I'd pull the spindle out of the middle of it, and I'd try and put the quarter on that to have it s stay there as the turntable was spinning around. If it's off center at all, it would throw it off. Uh, and I could got so I could do it at 33 revolutions and at 45, but um, the faster speeds were harder at 78 RPM. I just couldn't do it. You'd be this tiniest little bit out of center. And what would happen then is because of the, the speed, the little bit of eccentricity to the quarter not being at the exact center caused it to just be ejected. If you think about the perfect holiness of God, it's, it's like that. Sin is incompatible with him, and it just tosses sin away. It doesn't take any decision or action by him. It's just that sin is incompatible um, with, uh, with him. So sin is a huge problem, not for God, but for us. Remember, God's fellowship with God the Son, God the, um, the Father, and God the Holy Spirit is perfect, and he knew that our lives and our relationships would be really damaged by sin, and so he designs a plan. And his plan of how to deal with sin and wounds in relationship is forgiveness. Well, how does he do it? Sin goes into the death of Jesus. Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, think about this. There is a, a wonderful essay by C.S. Lewis called Line Land. He was talking about a two-dimensional world, but that God lives in three dimensions. Another way you might think of this is 
we live like on a monopoly board. Remember those board games? They used to, before you did them electronically, you could have these cardboard games and you move the pieces around, roll the dice, and you have the space that you're on, that's the present. You have where you were, that was yesterday, your memories, and you have the future, which is unknown. But here is Lineland where we live. God is above that, past, present, and future is present to him at the same time. This is very, very bad news. The reason it's bad news is if you only sinned once, that one time when you were 12 years old, when you stole a piece of penny candy, or dollar candy, whatever it was, <laughs> in your growing up years, or you told one lie only once, that sin is forever in front of God. And it's always going to be an obstacle between us and him. It causes us to want to run away, and we feel like we can't embrace him in relationship. Um, in fact, it was so bad that the response of the people in Jesus' time was they wanted his righteousness, the light of the world, to stop illuminating their sin so much that they killed the light. So what does Jesus do? He can't say it doesn't matter because his perfect holiness means it has to matter. So there has to be another way. In the garden, before suffering and dying, Jesus cries out to the Father, is there any other way? Is it possible for this cup to pass? And the Bible records only silence from the Father at that moment. And then Jesus in resignation says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, your will be done. Now I'm sure he wasn't looking forward to what he knew would be a physically torturous death. And as awful and horrible as that was, it was nothing compared to the spiritual cost. Remember, think theologically, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, perfect fellowship. They jointly decide to create. God the Son is the agent of the Father's idea, and He speaks. He is the Word of God, John 1. The, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. So he creates, the word creates by speaking creation. And then the word epitomizes the perfection of incarnation, fleshing out of God's heart and desire. And Jesus is born into the world as a human baby. Theologians sometimes call that the divine humiliation because all of the perks that God the Son had in heaven, he set aside all that power to live in the humility and the helplessness and the vulnerability of a human life. But Jesus still, as a baby, as a boy, and as a man, had perfect intimacy and fellowship with the Father in his spirit. I'm sure there were times as his intellect and intellectual understanding was growing that he learned new things. He was like us, to how we learn and grow, but in Hebrews it says he was like us in every respect except that he never sinned. So from the time he was born, he knew not only the warmth of his mother's arm, but the intimate fellowship with the Father. So in Gethsemane, Gethsemane is a compound, and actually the Hebrew words are get shemir, 
if you go to a bagel shop, sometimes they'll say, you want a schmear with that. You know, it's some cream cheese with some flavor in it. it schmear means crushed. Get means olive. So he went to get Gethsemane, the place where the olives were crushed to make olive oil, the place where Jesus was being crushed by suffering in order to release the oil of his, the healing balm of his body. And what he was saying, I don't want to do this. If, it's, if there's another way, let me know, because I don't want to do this. But there wasn't another way. So he chooses not only to be crushed by our sin, but to die. So what is theologically brilliant and spectacularly important for us is Jesus' death provides the only place where your sin and my sin can go that it's not between me and the Father. It's gone. He dies, and it's really Jesus' human body dying, and it's God the Son dying on there, but not forever, because he will rise again. And then the creed says that he descended into hell. Well, what's that about? Because he never sinned. It's because the weight of my sin weighed him down into the depths. The weight of your sin put him through the equivalent of an eternity in hell in the days that he was there. And then when he rose triumphant, he was victorious not only over death, but also over our sin. So it provides a victory for us. And his death is the only, only place that sin can go and actually disappear. So if you have sin in your life and Jesus says, give it to me, I'll take it. You know, one of my favorite things, sometimes they have these little microphones or big microphones, I guess you say, on the sidelines at football games. Earl Campbell, remember him? A great, great running back with um, thighs the size of trees, no body fat, just all muscle. And occasionally when the microphone was from the sideline was pointed at the huddle when the Cowboys were gathering together, you'd hear Earl Campbell and he's saying to the quarterback, give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball. And then he would take it and just power and power and power through. And here's Jesus huddled up and he says, give me the sin, give me the sin. I'll take it. I can deal with it. You can't deal with it. Give it to me. I'll take it. And we give our sin to him and it goes into the death of Jesus. So where is that leave sin's reign on our lives now? clean clean there was a lady named Nancy Honeytree that I knew when I was a pilot in the Air Force she's a brand new Christian singer and she sang a song called clean before my Lord she said clean before my Lord I stand and in me not one blemish does he see when I placed all my burdens on him he cast my sin away so Jesus not only forgives us but he deals with our sin absolutely stunning he wants us to do things too now what if somebody does something absolutely horrible to us Rather than thinking that the power lies in the horrible thing that the person has done, I want to say, don't have a God that's too small. The death of Jesus is sufficient even for horrible things. I'm not going to recount them, but if you've watched the news in the last few months, 
you've heard news reports of things that are more awful than are imaginable. Is the death of Jesus sufficient for that? Yes, it is. But what did Jesus do? He forgave us. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When did he say that? He said that with his body pierced on the cross, a crown of thorns on his head, nails probably through his wrists and through his feet, a spear wound in his side, and having to pull himself up on the cross so he could get a breath and speak, he chooses to say about us, Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. Nobody could be that evil that they could know that they were destroying their own opportunity for forgiveness and still do it. So Jesus says, forgive. And then he tells us what he requires. Matthew chapter 18. Peter came to him and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? That doesn't really say, but I'm guessing the way that Peter asked that question, he was thinking, seven times is a lot. <laughs> I think Jesus is going to be impressed by this. And Jesus says, nope, I don't say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, if you're a a student of Hebrew, this is a Hebraism, it's called. It's a colloquial expression in Hebrew. And 70 times 7 means infinity. Because 7 is the number of fullness. So 70 is a multiplication of fullness. So the multiplication of fullness times fullness gives you infinity. So Jesus is saying it doesn't stop. You've got to keep forgiving. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. He wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let me translate. 10,000 talents, talents 75 pounds of silver, 10,000 times 75. This is like the national debt for Israel. How on earth could a servant get into debt to his master for this gazillion dollars worth of, of debt. But he was. And surprise, Jesus says, he was not able to pay. So his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he has. By the way, um, it's a sobering thought that people are not alone responsible for their own sin. People's sin can impact other people's lives as well. He demanded that payment would be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him and said, Ma Master, have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. How's he going to do that? The master of the servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Gazillion dollars of debt forgiven. When his fellow servants saw this, they were amazed. That servant went out, found one of his other fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii was a day's wages. He laid his hands upon him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Exact same words this guy had just said to the master. And he would not but he threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. So then, his fellow servants saw what had been done. They were very grieved, and they came to their master and told him all that had been done. The master, after he'd called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? 
The master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Fasten your seatbelts. Matthew 18, 35, Jesus then goes on to say, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. What does this mean to be turned over to the torturers? The tormentors were people in the prison system back then who would make people suffer. But when we don't forgive, we live in torment. The person who doesn't forgive, one of my friends said, it's like drinking poison yourself and hoping the person you're mad at will get sick. It's not that anything happens to them as much as it is something that happens to you. So judgment is what Jesus is calling us away from and he's also he said in other places don't be a judge. You know that's Jesus' place. The reason it's such a big deal is when you are judging somebody else you are going to the throne room of heaven next to Jesus and you're bouncing him out of his throne and sitting down in his seat because he's the only one who has won the right to judge. It's even more true with eternal issues. You know, I work a lot with Muslim background believers. Many maybe even most, have been traumatized. There's something called the Ummah in Islam, which is the ecosystem of everything. Uh, it's not like here. Here your religious faith, uh, your spiritual life is centered around the church, and then you have other spheres of your life. In Islam, everything is connected. So it's religious life, Education, because the, the schools are run uh, by the um, the mosque, uh, the judicial system, the banking system, the social structure, and um, the military. It's everything. So when someone of Muslim background comes to faith in Christ, when they meet Jesus, they are kicked away from the ummah, which has been the whole center of their life. It's been not just the, what happens at the mosque, it's absolutely everything. And one of the issues that we have as the, the church is that we need, we've got these millions of MBBs, Muslim background believers, who have lost the ummah. Um, um is, uh, the root word is mother. So the ummah is the, like the, the mothering of, of everything and they come to the church, we jolly well better offer to them um, an image of the body of Christ that is the ummah, the social structure that should have been. And God was very clear of this about this starting from Genesis. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor, as yourself. So when we offer to people who are MBBs that come out of that background and come into a relationship with Christ, if we offer them um, a watered down call to commitment, we are not being faithful to Jesus, nor are we doing them any favors. Uh, because they are hungry for the fullness of what it means to be followers of Jesus. 
They've already given up everything to follow him. Sometimes even their families even try and kill them. I, I know lots who have said that their fathers had come after them to try uh, and uh, kill them. So let's take, let's say about what forgiveness is not first. Forgiveness itself is not restoration of relationship. If somebody wrongs you and you forgive them, that does not mean the relationship is restored. Um, we um, want relationships to be restored, but forgiveness is a separate issue from relational restoration. Another thing that forgiveness is not is not accountability for the offender. I was talking recently to a man who was incredibly gentle, he's an MBB, um, and he's, he's the most guileless, most gentle man I think I've ever been with. And somebody said, do you know his story? And I said, no, I don't, but he certainly is, he's a sweetheart. I mean, he's just guileless and gentle. I said, yeah, he was uh, from Syria. He was a journalist, and he criticized the government and was imprisoned and went through horrible, horrible torture. And um, later, I was sitting with him at, um, at lunch, and I said, you really have risen above the horrible things that you endured and you're not bitter. And he said, oh, no, no. The bitterness destroys. The answer is forgiveness. The answer is forgiveness. Now, here's a complicating factor. When somebody sins against us or there's a disruption of relationship that that, and there's unpleasantness that's introduced, shame is a part of it. It's a component. Um, shame has two different types. Uh, one type of shame is called healthy shame. Um, and the other kind is called toxic shame. Now, healthy shame is designed to help us learn the values of the community, the people that we live with. It's relationally based. It actually lives in a different part of the brain. It lives over on the right hemisphere where your relationships are, are managed. That happens too quickly for your thinking side to track. Um, we, in healthy shame, we're able to remain relational um, we learn the values of our people. And in toxic shame, let's see if we can see that. Toxic shame is destructive. Can that come through? I'll just have to read it. Uh, it's destructive, it's non relational, and it's condemning. Who is it that is. Um, let's come back. There we go. Who is it? that is destructive, non-relational, and condemning. Hmm. 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 Oh, it's so tempting to name names here. But no, it's not people. <laughs> it's not people. It's the devil. And what the devil tries to do with toxic shame, which actually occurs in a different part of the brain. It happens on the left side, where we think about stuff, and we run with that, and we descend into a pit of feeling terrible. Um, and Satan always uses toxic shame. He never uses healthy shame. But in our families, um, we should have healthy shame. And the way healthy shame works, it's like, a, um, like an Oreo. Chocolatey goodness with a filling and more chocolatey goodness. Johnny, love you. You're terrific. 
you need to remember, close the door when you go to the bathroom, little boy. Uh, that's stuff the family doesn't need to be welcomed into. But I have every confidence that you're going to um, make right decisions, and we are happy about the great um, future that you have. What shame can cause us to do is justify what we're doing to make us feel better and to not feel like we're on the outs. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't important. It wasn't a big thing. Narcissists are particularly gifted at finding creative ways to say something's not their fault. The good news is there are not a lot of true clinical narcissists in the world. The bad news is there's a little narcissism in all of us. Sorry. So if you're justifying when there is an upset with somebody, you're justifying yourself, that's not a good sign. That's a war that shame is causing you to wage against um, forgiveness. Shame can also drive us into retaliation and it can cause us to do something called relitigating. What relitigating is doing is, even if there's been some superficial measure of forgiveness, relitigating is going back with somebody unrelated to this and talking about the wrong that was done to us to get people on our side so that they will think that we're better than we are and they will think somebody else is terrible not um, not right, not the good thing to do. Um, it is not redemptive to do those kind of uh, behaviors. Instead, um, we need to remember the kind of relationship we want to have with Jesus is the kind of way that we ought to be loving other people. Do you want Jesus relitigating stuff with you about your sins that you've offered to him? We certainly don't. We want grace. And as much as we're able, we need to give grace. But here's a little tip. Dive into the forgiveness that Jesus has offered you. Celebrate with him how he has forgiven you and how he has set you free and transformed your life. And that will give you more capacity to love other people. It also provides us with an opportunity to manifest kingdom values and when we get things right, there's a surprise. Almost exactly 20 years ago, there was a huge international conference that I had been working on a team with some other people to gather. Senior Christian leaders from all over the world were gathering. I was supposed to be the master of ceremonies for the whole thing and introduce people and articulate you know, the, the purposes why we were gathered and tie together one talk to another, you know, the kind of thing that, that happens. And ver just before we were about to begin, the same earlier the same day when this thing we'd worked on for so many years happened, the, the guy who was the originator of the idea came to me and said, yeah, sorry about this, but um, I can't have you on the platform. And I said, hmm. Can I ask why? And he said, well, I've just gotten word that um, your behavior has been so bad internationally that the archbishops that are coming here, these very, very senior leaders, won't have anything to do with you. And I was kind of at a loss because I wasn't aware of any conflict. And he said, um, so you're just being replaced. Um, and I thought, I mean, it was horrible. I mean, it was a a horrible rejection, not because of um, 
that I wanted the attention or publicity of being the master of ceremonies, but because I'd really worked hard and I thought what we were doing was really critically important. Um, and I, I saw one of the archbishops and I said, do you know anything about these? He said, absolutely nothing. He said, I think it's a lie. Um, and then somebody else said something and I figured out what had happened, that there was somebody who was jealous of the influence that I had and he wanted my position and so he had created a lie to get me removed, hoping that he could step into the, the position. And while I was sort of licking my wounds, I thought, man, I could just leave. And I thought, no, you know, what's happening here is important, even though all the things are messed up. I'm just going to go sit with the, uh, in the audience of this uh, conference. And then they, they, during the evening, they got into a thing of thanking everybody and their dog who had done anything involved with this. And they keep naming more and more people and what they've done, and people are kind of looking over at me, more people are looking. And so they're winding up and saying, this really, these are all the people that we want to thank. And somebody actually leaned over and said, you've been working on this for years. Why are you not being recognized? And I said, I didn't do anything to be recognized. I only did what the Lord asked me to do, hoping it would bear some fruit. So I don't need to have any recognition and the Lord spoke to me and showed me the face of the guy who had betrayed me and um, I said, you know, Lord, I really do mean this. I do release him. And the Lord said, and for this cause you are being promoted in the kingdom. And I felt this rush wash over me of the pleasure of God. Remember Chariots of Fire? When um, is it Gordon Lytle is, said, when I run, I feel the pleasure of the Father. I felt this pleasure of God wash over me. And I thought, you know what? If I saw that guy right now, I would actually, I would run up and hug him and kiss him on the cheek. Because what he intended for ill, the Lord has said, even if nobody knows, I know, and I have chosen to promote you. That's what redemption can look like. And so then I set, uh, set out over the next several years to uh, build relationship with him. Um, he was a bishop, and... Um, when a bishop is consecrated, they're given a cross. Um, and I had one that was a twin of mine, um, which is, so I might be able to get to it. Um, so this is called a Jerusalem cross, and it means different things, but the, the, my favorite application is it's the whole gospel Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth are the four little crosses. Um, Jerusalem is like ministering inside the church. Judea are the people that were not in the church, but they were nearby. They were in Judea. So they're people that are like us, but not yet with us. Samaria are the people that are near us, like Samaria is near to Jerusalem, but they're a different culture. And the ends of the earth is the ends of the earth. So when I had mine made, um, the, I had a guy in um, here in Texas that carved this for me, and on the back I had I asked him to put Isaiah six eight. The Lord said, "Who who will I send? Here am I, send me." Because that was a very important verse in my life. Um, but for the, my my other colleague um, that had done me so terribly wrong, I had an exact copy carved for him. But on the back, his says. Uh, Psalm 133, 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. He was, he was shocked. Um, and I treated him like a friend. And a couple of years later, there was a meeting. And he said, are you going to this meeting? And I said, no, I can't be there. 
but I heard you were going to be there, and I know I can trust you to look out for my interests. And I could see the shock on his face, and something inside him melted. And he said, yes, I promise I will be there. And so a wounded relationship took several years for the relationship to be healed. But years before that, I'd forgiven him. Sometimes we get restoration, too. Um, sometimes forgiveness can be complicated. Um, we have needs of inner healing, especially when we have been um, dramatically uh, wounded. Uh, another problem is there are certain things that can happen in our lives to which upper level cosmic forces of evil get involved. Uh, there are some things that we can do that cause not just lower level common variety, gar um, garden variety demons to hang around, but the upper level uh, cosmic forces will attach themselves to our lives when we say things like, I will never. An inner vow that we make is an invitation to a, a high-level evil cosmic force to attach itself to our life. Why is that such a big deal? Because when I say I will never, I have dethroned Jesus from being the Lord. I need to say whatever you say, Lord, is what I will do. And when I choose to be Lord myself, then the forces of hell at the highest level say an ally in rebellion to the lordship of Jesus. And in some way, they come and attach to that. With ordinary demonic powers, we can say, in the authority I have in Jesus, I'm telling you be gone in the name of Jesus, and it goes. The higher level ones, if you remember from the book of Jude, um, Michael the archangel is contending with Satan over the body of Moses who has just died on Mount Nebo and Michael the most magnificent warrior in all of creation does not contend directly with Satan but he steps aside and says the Lord rebuke you And with Satan and other high-level evil cosmic forces, we really need to do the same thing and not be presumptuous and operate above our pay grade. Each uh, Christian, each believer in Christ is given a sphere of authority. Uh, you have a, one sphere of authority is over your life, Parents have a metron, a measure of authority. The Greek word for measure is metron. And so the metron of parents includes their children. The metron of a governor would include his state, a president, uh, or king, their nation, or their kingdom, or whatever. Those are our, our uh, natural and physical um, measures of authority. We have the same thing spiritually. I remember one day I was sitting in my office and a physician, um, intercessor physician, called and said, well, I'm, I just want to let you know, later this week I'm headed to Rome. And I said, oh, that's Ro Rome's a great city. Why are you going to Rome? Well, I'm going to the Vatican to rebuke the Roman Catholic Church for its errors. Um, and I said, well, you are certainly not doing that on my behalf because you don't have any standing to do that. And I'm going to do you a favor and tell you, don't go and don't do that. Because if you operate outside your assignment, you will get your lunch eaten. 
and it's going to be a mess. Uh, John Paul Jackson has a book, um, called, I think it's called Axis at the Moon, and what he's talking about is people that operate beyond their measure of authority are as ineffective as somebody throwing an axe at the moon. But then later on it occurred to me, you know, if you throw an axe at the moon, it's going to come back down, and it might do some real serious damage. All right, here's another complicating factor. And that is, you may be dealing with a person who has hurt you that hasn't repented. Um, I was talking to a very experienced Christian pastor not too long ago, and I knew he'd had terrible trouble with, a, with somebody else, and I said, you know, how are you coming? I know he really hurt you with forgiving him. He said, it's not possible. I can't, it's not possible to forgive him. He hasn't repented. And I said, hold on. Um, the other person's repentance is not required for you to forgive them. He said, well, how can you, how can you do that? How can you forgive them? It's because Forgiveness and healing are not the same thing. You know, if Jack Ledbetter gets mad at me and takes a screwdriver and stabs it into my leg, <laughs> he's actually never done that. <laughs> I'm not expecting him to, <laughs> although I may have increased the chances of it happening by using his name. <laughs> but of course I would forgive him. Would the wound still be there? It, take, it could take a long time for that wound to heal. The wound is different from the forgiveness. That what forgiveness is, is the process, or healing rather, is the process of transfiguring the wounds in my body, my soul, or my spirit. But forgiveness is releasing the person who's wounded, wounded you from having to pay for the wound that they did. See the difference? One is releasing, the other is coming to the place where you uh, own the release and then you can pursue healing. This is a little challenging um, because maturity is woven into forgiveness as well. And the reason it's challenging is mostly we are less mature than we think we are. I was talking with, I called Jim Keller, he's the, the brain science guru. He calls himself a neurotheologian. I said, hey Jim, I saw the other day that a quote that was attributed to you. It said that you had said 90% of American men are still in the infant level of maturity when they get married. There are five levels of maturity. Infant, child, adult, parent, elder. And I said, did you say that 90% of men in America who are married are in infant level maturity when they get married? He's on the phone and I hear this pause and he says, yes. <laughs> I said it. But I was too generous. <laughs> the problem with maturity is maturity is not something that proceeds because of our choice. Maturity in my life is a result of the family and community that I'm part of. Because the way your brain works, you have to see something in order to replicate it. Sadly, you cannot get it from a book. You must get it from observing somebody's life. So if there's a maturity skill that you want to have, how to return to joy, how to come to peace, how to um, manifest forgiveness, how to be courageous, um, 
who's the congressman? Um, Dan Crenshaw um, has a book about courage. And one of his very simple statement is, he says in his book, courage breeds courage. They know that. And so get a new Navy SEAL next to an experienced Navy SEAL who has acted courageously, and the new Navy SEAL will learn more courage. Same thing is true in church. When you see courage, you can become more courageous. You do have to agree to participate, but the possibility of increasing in courage or increasing in maturity isn't there if you don't have somebody manifesting the skill that you don't yet have. Maturity calls us to manifest redemption and not retaliation and also to not justify our actions. Forgiveness is God's remedy for my heart. Wrong button. Even for the worst offenses, even if a person has betrayed me, even if the offender has lied to me, even if they've cheated me, even if there was premeditated evil intent to do great harm to me, even if they remain unrepentant, and even if confronting them to work things out is not possible. You know how I know all those things? Because my wife is an expert at forgiveness. And she's learned all of those things. And she's the one who made the list. Now we're going to move quickly. <laughs> we're going to move quickly now. I'm going <laughs> to give you 10 steps that you can go through in forgiveness. The first step maybe we're not. This died. Let me just give you a couple of these and then we'll we'll come back later and come up and get you a, a handout for them. Speak and declare out loud before God my forgiveness of the person. Thank you. The second one, ask God to change my heart. You don't have to remember all 10 of these. We'll give you the list later. I just want you to hear kind of her process and what I've learned from her. Three, pray to be healed of the wound their sin caused in me. Pray that I will receive double honor for the shame that came as a result of the sin against me. Now we're getting hard. Extend God's heart of mercy toward them. Believe that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. getting harder. Pray for them and ask God to bless them. Now we're getting into graduate school of forgiveness. Pray to be forgiven of the judgments I've made about them and against them as a result of their actions against me. Pray that the open door to the devil in their life that I caused by accusation, judgment, or jealousy will be closed. Pray that the Lord would deliver them from the evil that I brought to their life. Let this catch up. I'm going to back up to that one. Pray that the open door to the devil 
in their life that I caused by my accusations, judgment, or jealousy be closed. Those are things that I've done in reaction to a wound against me. And that part of the forgiveness that's necessary is for that to, to change. And it's been amazing to learn from my wife that we can do this to pray that that person's life will not be assaulted by the devil. Nope, let's die again. Um, and then release them. Declare that I release this person to Jesus. Declare I no longer bind them to myself in unforgiveness or offense. And declare that they are released Jesus. So forgiveness is a huge opportunity for us. Not only to inherit more of the fruit of the Spirit, but to extend the reign of the kingdom. There are people here, I'm sure, or people watching that have had horrible things done to them. And here's what I want to say to you. Choosing to forgive them does not make it right. It does not mean that God is not going to hold them responsible. It may even be that somebody's done something terribly wrong to you and you could forgive them. You may still be called to testify against them in a trial. Because there are some things that are wounds to us that we need to forgive. They're still crimes against the community. And the state will legally pursue them. And it's not unforgiveness to agree to testify against somebody who's a perpetrator. But you still need to forgive them. There may be somebody who's done great harm in your life. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, Paul said. We're not idiots. We know that people do great harm to us. Restoring relationships and getting healed take our process that take time. But forgiving is something that you can choose to do now. And when you do, the torment that we're under from maintaining unforgiveness can end. So as we're closing here and we're going to say goodbye to the feed, bless you and see you online next week with John returning.